Thank you so much, uh, Melanie, for this fascinating presentation, which, uh, among other things, shows that um, collaboration and interdisciplinarity uh, when it comes to digital preservation of games uh, between people from hum humanities, media studies, uh, and engineers, computer sciences is, is strongly uh, needed. Uh, so thank you, and this is in part what we are trying to do in, in Lausanne. Um, I'm now going to welcome John Paul Dyson. Uh, John Paul Dyson is the director of the International Center for the History of Electronic Games uh, in Rochester. Um, it's a part of the uh, Strong Museum, uh, uh, Strong Museum of Play, um, and the uh, ICHEG uh, has one of the biggest physical collection and archive of video games, over 60,000 video games, I believe. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us, John Paul. Thank you. Um, it's, again, thank you for inviting me. And uh, as the other speakers have said, it's just a real honor and, and we appreciate all your hospitality for being here. So today I want to sort of offer in some ways a personal perspective, I guess personal if you can apply it to an institution, but it's also, I guess, my journey as well. Just some background on, um, on who, who I am my, um, and my training. I have no formal training in video game preservation. I think this is something that's common to a lot of people in this field who are here. We sort of entered a lot of entered in this period when there really wasn't a field. And so we sort of learned, as Melanie was saying, learn by doing in some sense. There's this craft aspect. You face a challenge, and Jason talked a lot about those, and you find a solution for that. And I come from a perspective, my training is as a 19th century uh, intellectual and cultural historian. And about 24 years ago, a little over 24 years ago, I got a job at the Strong Museum which at the time had nothing to do with play. Um, and it's sort of a longer story about that. But in 2003, we adopted play as our mission. I had been there for about five years. And so I served two roles there, and they have an overlapping impact on the way we approach video games. So for one thing, I am um, vice president for exhibits. Our museum is a very playful place. You would hope the Museum of Play would be playful. Um, and so it's sort of a mashup between, say, a history museum and Disney. And so in, when I wear that hat, <coughs> and it says doing something like game design, where um, you have deadlines, you need to get an exhibit out, you're creating experiences for guests. And um, so that gives me, in some ways, an appreciation when I go to, for instance, the Game Developers Conference. I learn things because we have deadlines, we have crunch, we need to, to make those things work. And then also, um, as Slim said, I'm director of the International Center for the History of Electronic Games. And that's something that really grew out of our broader interest in play. So we are, um, just to give you some background here, we're in um, Rochester, New York. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Rochester is somewhere sort of near Niagara Falls. So it's up here. Um, so there's Toronto. We're about six hours up north of New York City. So I often get people coming from overseas to say, I'll be in New York. I want to drop by the museum. And then I usually respond quickly, just so you know, it's a six hour uh, car ride up here. So, um, so if you are in New York City, it's an easy plane ride up and back again, probably your best bet. Um, and we are, as I said, a physical museum. We get about 600,000 guests a year, or just before COVID, that's what we're getting. And I'll talk a little bit about expansion we're doing. We expect that to be about a million people a year. Rochester itself is about 200,000 people um, in the city. And we are a museum that is <coughs> about play. So one of the things I think that is common for everyone who deals with video games is that your particular cultural institution will have its own approach. So if you're a computer museum, you will approach it a certain way. If you are strictly a video game museum, you'll approach it a certain way. We are um, a play museum, and so our collection goes much uh, deeper than that. So for instance, up here you can see this is a prototype for Monopoly, the board game Monopoly. This was created by Charles Darrow in the 1930s. <coughs> This is he created for his dining room table, so it's round. He handmade the, car, the, the cards, the houses and hotels, if you're familiar with Monopoly, are done from wood molding that he just chopped and stained. And uh, he made, there are a couple of misspellings in there, one of which still linger in the game. Um, and so we have materials like that, or this is uh, Thomas Edison's talking doll. It was a horrible creation. <laughs> um, Thomas Edison referred to it as his marvelous monstrosity. It had this, he used wax cylinders, and it had this shrieking, terrible voice. Um, and so recently, we actually, in one of our exhibits, we actually gave guests the opportunity to actually play this voice. So if they really want to horrify their children. Um, you know, 
I've talked at conferences at Games for Change, that things like educational games go back, as you all know, to much earlier before computer games. So this is the first commercial jigsaw puzzle um, that, uh, from a creator, John Spilsbury, who created the original for the children of King George III. Um, and it was meant to teach uh, political geography of Europe. And so that's what you have here. And so this is the first uh, commercial a jigsaw puzzle that have been told that the, the Dutch dispute that. They, they claim they have an earlier uh, antecedent. But that is an important, as we tell these stories, that when we look at educational games, like Jason talked about the Oregon Trail, for instance, we have the papers of Mech, the company that uh, published the Oregon Trail, that there are these predecessors before that. That this is not just about video games, that this exists in this broader context. These are the papers of Sid Saxon, who was probably the first independent game designer, um, not com computer games, but board games in the United States. And he kept these diaries, which are amazing. He was a bridge engineer. <coughs> and so every day he would write down um, which games he played um, and which um, people he talked with. And then the incredible thing is, is he would index these at the end of the year. So you can look and see who we talked with on December 17th of 1967. And actually we have an open source um, project right now where people are transcribing these for us. So if you go online um, and any of these things, if you go to museumofplay.org, you can see a lot of these as well as many examples from our collection. I think we have about 90,000 items uh, online um, that you can look at from the museum from our overall collection of more than 520,000 items. Um, so what happened was we adopted this play mission in 2003. And one of the things we had realized early in the museum's history <laughs> by messing this up, was that you couldn't stop at some arbitrary date. So originally when the museum founded, they stopped at 1940, and we realized that you had to keep up with the present day. And so as we looked at how play was changing, we recognized that video games were having this transformative impact on the way you, people played, the way they learned, the way they connected with each other. And so in 2006, we began collecting um, video games or studying them. And as I said, my background was in intellectual and cultural history, history of the book, history of science. And so we looked at it from this, this perspective. Whereas asking what were the questions that historians of the book or historians of science ask about their fields and then projecting forward to say, okay, historians in the future, scholars in the future will ask those same questions. So what do we need to collect now so that a hundred years from now, people can ask these questions and answer them. And so we looked at the games themselves. We looked at the experience of the producers of the game. Um, and then we also looked at players experience and play more general. That led um, eventually to the foundation of the International Center for the History of Electronic Games in 2009, and also the World Video Game Hall of Fame in 2015. And that's which we pick games. You see the inaugural members of the first class here um, that are determined by these uh, four criteria, icon status, longevity, geographical reach, and influence. And we have an international selection advisory committee. Uh, James and Melanie are actually have, been, have served on that in the past to help us decide this. There are 36 games in there right now. Um, and that's something that, to be honest, it both serves a useful interpretive purpose, but also draws attention every year to video games and to their importance culturally. We get about 1.5 billion media impressions for that um, each year in the U.S. Um, when that's announced. And there's lively debates over whether this is, should, game should be in or not. Casual games often provoke the most debate. So Windows Solitaire uh, earned its way in. And there were some people who were a little bit outraged by that. But then we also have vociferous defenders of that as well. And these are the, some of the sort of collections that we preserve. So we preserve archival materials. Um, here I've mentioned those already from key, um, key designers, uh, people like, I list a few here, Will Wright, Ralph Baer, Carol Shaw, um, people who've really shaped the, the industry. Sometimes they're auteurs, sometimes they're business people. So people like um, uh, Doug Carlson, who was the founder of the company Broderbund and was the initial founder of the Software Publishers Association, which was one of the first industry trade groups, and so preserving that business history as well. Uh, this, for instance, right here on the upper right is um, part of our Atari collection. So that came actually literally a whole tractor trailer lo load of materials that came. And this is uh, design documents for an arcade game, I think that's Gauntlet, which was a four-player game. And you see this sort of industrial design. I'll talk more about some of our arcade collection. We have more than 300 arcade um, and video games, we have just whimsical things like this Pac-Man board game. Um, you see just consoles that people had, lots of consoles. And then a lot of the archival materials are the rare things. So for instance, this right here is the first educational computer game. It's a game written created uh, by a woman Mabel Addis with a team, educational team and also IBM in 1963, 64. And in it, you played the role of 
a ruler of a Sumerian city in ancient Sumeria. Um, and it really set this tone for a lot of games. I, in fact, grew up playing a version of this game called Hammurabi on a mainframe computer when I was younger, and it had a lot of influence in this idea of simulation games. Um, you see other things here, for instance, um, here the, um, this uh, Ralph Baer, who earned the first patent um, for playing a video game on a television. We have a lot of his papers in the museum. This is uh, something, he worked at a defense contractor called um, Sanders, and so he came from this defense background. So he actually created the first military application of a video game. This is a light anti-tank weapon. It's an actual light anti-tank weapon that he modified so it would shoot um, at Russian tanks being played in a VCR on a television. He brought it to the Pentagon and got a contract for it. And so we have this at the museum. And it's one of these things that shows the intersection of video games and, um, and broader issues in society like defense. These are Will Wright's notebooks where he's designed notebooks showing the, the Sims, um, how he's creating the Sims, SimCity 2000, Spore, other games. Uh, there have been a couple of references to Doom already here. Uh, Jason showed some. This is John Romero, who was one of the creators of Doom. He came to the museum and he saw we had another person's uh, programmer, Bill Budge, who did a game called Pinball Construction, that had his Apple II on display. And John said, I want my Apple II on display too. He says, send it to us, John, we'll put it on display. So he did, and we put it on display. And you see um, a lot of, this is from Roberta Williams, co-founder of Sierra, the King's Quest games. Uh, this is the, um, the chip plot for Pong that was used to produce Pong. And then here are a couple of um, arcade games, significant ones. This is a Computer Space, the first arcade video game created by Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari. And this is Humpty Dumpty, which again, arcades have this longer history going back to public amusements. And this was um, the first game with flippers uh, on the side, the first pinball game with flippers. So we preserve all these materials, and preservation is one of the key aspects of what we do because we take care of physical preservation in addition to digital preservation. So first of all, every object needs to be treated as a museum item. They're cataloged, they're photographed, they're put in line. Um, but then arcade games are tremendously complex. We make a lot of our arcade games um, accessible for people to play. Uh, we call them use of facts. And so when you have 600,000 people coming every year, you need to determine, you know, can the game stand up to it and can you have someone who can actually maintain it? So we have an amazing arcade technician who does everything from fixing uh, flippers to repairing uh, CRT televisions. Uh, we actually bought about 50 CRT televisions from the last factory making them in the world and so sort of stockpiled them. Um, but we also do things like 3D print, uh, print parts you can't get anymore um, because they're unavailable. We also do a lot with video capture uh, here as well. And we have a new digital games lab that allows people, researchers, and researchers are key audience for us, to come and play the game in the original format um, while simultaneously sending it through a computer, seeing it on a, both a CRT and a modern display so they can use it for, for their research. And we do a lot of things sort of like Jason is doing and others are doing. This is a Umatic machine where not all our items are, that we're preserving are just the games. There are actually other materials as well. So I think about this as a model, and as you might think about this, um, for me, with my, my background, one of the things I thought about was thinking about the role of cultural preservation over time in different contexts. So I remember taking a class in college about the classical um, legacy in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And as you probably know, one of the, the key aspects of preserving materials was that in classical texts were usually on papyrus, which was very fragile, tended to um, crumble and decay over time, and so it had been copied over by um, usually monks in monasteries under vellum codexes, codices, that would, um, were much more durable. And then you have the, in the Renaissance, um, people like Poggio Bracciolini, who would go and visit these. Supposedly he went to the monastery of St. Gallen here in, in Switzerland and saw this, um, this book that was uh, a rhetorical advice book from Quintilian, um, the classical author, and he wanted to take it with him, and the monk said, no, <laughs> sorry, you can't take it with you. So he stayed there for 54 days to copy it. And in many ways, what we're doing here, I think, and what Jason and Melanie talked about, is the same process of preserving cultural legacies. You're migrating data, not from an old, old scroll, to something more modern, to, to a book, but maybe from one form of computers to another. Um, and so you see some of this, these materials. So we may have just, um, uh, regular hardware like this or a game, but you also have relevant materials. So this is, has anyone here heard of, of Walter Lukas? He was a Swiss, so there's a dissertation out there somewhere. He was a Swiss game um, sort of journalist. He published essentially what is it, like um, 
um, a sort of newsletter that was all about board games and conflict simulation games. And he played this really important role in bringing a lot of American games in the 1970s to attention of people in Europe. He published a jo Joker in Euro and Europa. One was in German, one was in English, and he was based in Basel. And in here, in this is, we have a lot of his correspondence at the museum, and in here he's talking about computer games. So these other materials that inform how we understand video games are very important. And then we also preserve digital games as well, which is a huge problem and something we'll probably talk about later. So this is a game, if you remember when the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, someone created a little mini game based on that. And so uh, we preserve that as well um, in there. And preserving stuff digital is its own challenge. Again, you see, and these are sort of five different ways uh, we think about um, preserving, or, or six different ways to think about preserving games, original hardware and software, library and archival materials, media about games, uh, video capture, source code, and migration emulation. This is right here, if you play the game Prince of Persia, these are the original uh, photographs that Jordan Mechner, the creator of Prince of Persia, um, did when she took it. He actually filmed his brother playing, uh, uh, running and jumping in the suit. Then he froze it um, on using a VCR, took a picture with film, produced the film, and then hand colored it, and then hand um, entered into the computer using a device called the VersaWriter. And so we have these sort of physical materials that show the sort of deep work of digital, digital stuff going on. And again, you see things that we have to make these choices. One of the things that we, we and I think all institutions have is there's only so much you have resources. And so we decide, we sort of come up with this little sort of acronym here called RAVE. Um, so things are, what are things that are rare, at risk, valuable, and engaging? So you see Andrew Borman, who's a digital games curator. This is a build, early build of the game, game Age of Empire. So it's like a rough draft of the game. And so this is something that we're preserving. It fit, fit these criteria. Andrew's actually streaming about this on Twitch as he was doing it. And so we, like every institution, have limits. We can only do so much. And so this is something that I think is really um, helpful for us to say, okay, this is where we want to put our resources here for this, this thing. And of course, we create exhibits as well. And so, um, and, and so some are online. So we just published, a, a, if you go to Google Arts and Culture, you can see a lot of our exhibits. This is one on the Jerry Lawson, who created the, was key in creating the interchangeable cartridge. Um, but we also have lots of physical exhibits. So we have a whole, um, a pinball exhibit, um, exhibits with, on video games, and this is part of our Women in Games initiative, exhibit on that, and we try to make sure to do some fun things. So this was a Nintendo exhibit that we did, and we made a giant NES that you could play, and uh, we still have that. Even though the exhibit came down, it was so popular, we just kept it going um, with that. And we're also in the middle of a big expansion, so we have about um, 90,000 square feet, so I guess that's about 9,000 or so, 8,500 uh, square feet that we're adding to the museum. And this will almost all be focused on video games. Some are very traditional exhibits. Um, and then another one, you'll actually get an RFID wristband. You will um, create an avatar and you'll go through a physical exhibit but earn virtual achievements and badges as you go through. It's all about video game history. So this is, this is coming up. So I just wanna sort of, to close, I guess, in thinking about um, video games as this question of what is, as you may be thinking, if, if you're an institution, what is the role, what is the play um, the video games can have? So first of all, I'd make a case for the importance of video games and play in general. Um, Johan Huizinga, whose book Homo Ludens is probably one of the key sort of texts in play studies, he makes this, this point that, uh, that civilization arises and unfolds in and as play, that in some sense play precedes civilization. So if we think about culture, there's this play aspect, this ludic aspect of, of play, which is really important in terms of generating culture itself. So I would make a case that play itself is fundamental to civilization and therefore fundamental to the role of humanities. Um, but then you also have, I think, real arguments in the case of video games for why they are um, important, size of the industry, the prime, uh, being a prime driver, how people become digital natives. I think this, this factor of, um, that has been underexplored, I think, the way that video games are shaping the way that we see the world. Just as in the no 19th century, the novel shaped the way people saw the world and f feelings of empathy and sympathy for others. The video games, with their fluidity of uh, identity and agency, I think are really shaping the way we, as a broader culture, experience the world. And I think that's something that's just beginning to be um, understood. And I make the point, and lots of people make this point, that 
gaming is no longer just a niche, uh, a niche product. There's a game that's huge in the US and it's popular here called Wordle, which is a word game. My 85 year old mother plays it daily. She is in some sense gaming and I think this thing is, is universal. So I think if your institution is thinking about preserving video games, whether you're an art museum or science museum, some questions to think about. What is the relationship of video games to your mission? There's no point in doing something that's unrelated to your mission. I think that's a key question. What is the appeal of video games to your audiences? Um, who are your audiences? Are they general public, scholars, students? Um, and then I made this point about preserving video games um, as an important role. But again, what are your goals in preserving them? Um, and what's your focus? I think that's really key. And how would you like to interpret video games? What are the revenue, revenue possibilities for us? They both drive some revenue from the arcade machines, but they've greatly expanded our audience. We get people who never would have come to our museum before because they're video, we have video games. But I also think, what are the long-term costs of preserving them? What are the physical and digital storage costs you'll have to deal with? Um, and are you building sustainable institutional knowledge? But lastly, I think this is the, the most important point. You know, what can you do with video games that you can't do with other cultural products? So we saw a demonstration this morning, and the students here did this Luzon 1830 game. I think it's a great example of something you can only do with video games. You can't do it with other things. And so ask yourself that question as an institution, what can you do with video games? And lastly, most important, just have fun with it. And, you know, if it's not fun, if you take it too seriously, you're probably missing the point um, of the medium. So that's it. I'm happy to follow up with any other questions afterwards. Thanks.